and welcome to the global series on hydrogen, where we slice through the buzz to see how the rhetoric of the market, especially green hydrogen, can be turned into reality. We're very glad to have Dr. Naveed Akhtar with us today. He is the founder and CEO of High Hybrid Energy. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Thank you for joining us. Let's start with some, start with some broad strokes. Fuel cells remain expensive, partly because the technology behind them is relatively costly. And driving down these costs while enhancing performance are main, among the main goals to stimulate market growth and get greener vehicles on the road, which is especially as important, of course, as we know the global population and therefore road usage and car usage is going to be increasing up to 2050, nearly 10 million people, uh, billion people on the planet by mid-century. With all that in mind, what do you think needs to be done this year to drive down the cost of fuel cell technology? Yeah, look, uh, when we are looking at the fuel cell cars, or I would say any, any of the mobility applications for cars, buses, trucks, one of the key challenges where right now we are facing is the cost. And I would give you like a very quick, you know, metric we normally use as a, a in the industry. So we normally use PLACE, and that's a very common metric used for fuel cell kind of, you know, industry. And P stands for uh, power, and then L for lifetime. Then you have the A for availability, C for cost, and, uh, and E for efficiency. So within that matrix, majority of the things are completely resolved, I would say. It is just the cost, which is which is far, far too high. And I can give you an example. Uh, for example, there are currently three or four, four commercial uh, fuel cell cars are available in the market, but their price compared to our conventional petrol diesel based cars is roughly two to three times higher, depending on where, which, the region you are looking at. And so that's, the, oh, sorry, that's only three or four cars on the planet. Yeah, so the, 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 this actually it is the, what's called the manufacturers who are making that. So the two of the manufacturers are in Japan. So Toyota is making those cars commercially available to anyone who want to buy. Honda is doing that from Japan. The third one is the Hyundai from Korea. And the fourth one is in, in Germany, but they are not commercial yet. So they are selling, you know, some kind of local uh, prototypes and all these things. So I would say three are the major suppliers, which, you know, anyone can buy the fuel cell cars right now. So as you asked me the question, why, you know, uh, why there is a hindrance in terms of the mass uh, deployment, the main, uh, key reason for that problem is the cost actually itself for the fuel cell car. And mm -hmm. then the next question is what goes into the car. So in within the car, there are two key things which you, you need to be looking at. One is the fuel cell system or fuel cell module, which itself is much, much costly than your normal engine or, or your combustion engine in the present cars. The second is you need to have hydrogen storage on board, which means you need to have some kind of hydrogen tanks and these tanks are also very expensive so these are the two key elements which are making up this cost to be very very high and unless we go to a mass production of these volumes because currently these cars are sold in numbers of you know hundreds thousands very very small numbers unless you make them mass manufacturing you know you deploy them and on the same side you may have heard this chicken and egg problem which means mm -hmm. uh, you have the cars but the the refueling stations are not there and uh, in to be honest in my case a lot of my colleagues and my friends they asked me you know why Navid, when you would have your own fuel cell car the, the problem for me is not the car i can buy the car right now the problem is there is no nearby hydrogen refueling station for me to refuel my car and if i don't have refueling station you no know, that, that doesn't work so it's both do things together do you think there's too much emphasis in the media and as part of the mainstream narrative there's too much emphasis on the actual vehicle and not on ensuring that whole supply chain is there so that people like yourself who do want to buy the vehicle they still can't do it because that supply chain just isn't strong enough do you think there needs to be a, a change in the focus there yeah, I would say it is dependent on the regions, you know, across the world where you are living at. I can give you two basic examples here. So the country where we are living is the UK. And here we are talking roughly 14 to 17 refueling station right now, roughly that that number. Whereas if you- And, that, take, and that's for a nation of nearly 70 million. That's right. And if you now pick the example, of Germany, which is, I would say, much more advanced in, you know, the cars manufacturing, they have taken a completely different approach. So itself, if you see, you know, majority of the big manufacturers like Audi, for example, Mercedes, 
for example, and BMW, you know, these are the key players, but they, they were really hesitant to, to mass produce those cars unless they see there are refilling stations. So mm -hmm. what they have done, German has, I, in my opinion, Germans have taken the best approach in solving this chicken and egg problem. What they decided, instead of putting too much investments on developing the fuel cell cars, they spent the money on setting up a hydrogen refueling stations first. And currently in Europe, uh, Germany is the number one in terms of refueling stations. And currently, as of now, roughly speaking, we are 90 refueling station, 90 refueling stations are already operational in Germany. And I've given you the numbers, you know, in UK. So we are far behind compared There's to Germany. There's a big gap. That's right. And now the reason why, why Germany has taken a completely different approach, there is a, you know, there, there is a reason behind this. The reason is Germany is looking uh, in order to bring the cost down for a hydrogen supply chain and also all other drivetrain components. The main thing is you have to go bigger. Bigger means instead of focusing on passenger cars, you have to focus on, let's say, trucks, buses, and all these things. And once you go bigger and bigger, then you increase the utilization of hydrogen hydrogen for those manufacturing manufacturings of those mobiles automobiles for example let's say take the example of a fuel cell bus a fuel cell bus roughly consumes roughly speaking eight to ten times more hydrogen which means you are consuming for a single bus you are adding up the volume by ten times more and mm -hmm. by doing that your utilization goes up and cross cost uh, cost goes down and that's the approach uh, germans have taken rather than spending too much on the on the fuel cell or passenger cars they did the other approach which means you know it's like who picks the chicken and who picks the egg that's that's the example there and germany picked right in this case yes. are you seeing any other regions that, you, that stand out to you that have have picked correctly and that are able to ramp up like yep. germany has ramped up yeah i would say uh, japan is also a very good example japan is doing i would say both things together so mm -hmm. they have a, it was the time by 2014 november ish time and they released their first uh, mass manufacturing car which is toyota mirai to the market and what i have noted you know if i look uh, anything before that time frame, like, you know, I'm picking a time between 2001 to 2000 to 2014, 13, 14, there was hardly any big momentum, you know, in terms of hydrogen push or fuel cell cars. First, uh, this Toyota took the lead and before that, slightly before there was Hyundai, they also made one earlier version of their car, but this was not too much sold and they changed to the model. So Japan is a very good example. Within Japan, they have roughly speaking 146 uh, refueling hydrogen refueling stations plus they have their own manufacturing uh, of two different models uh, two different companies working on honda is selling fuel cell cars commercially and the toyota is doing this, this job so i would say japan i would rank japan number one in this because they are solving both problems rather than uh, focusing on one and have a very streamlined value chain as well to be manufacturing and rolling out at the same time that's right all, all on all on home turf well, that's very true. The other third thing I would say, if you look the example of US, in US is more of a specific regional approach. Mm. California is doing really well. They are talking roughly close to 40 to 42 kind of refueling stations and plus, you know, many buses. Again, in US, the approach is the very similar what Germans are doing, you know, keep building the refueling station and, and uh, support them with a heavy duty buses, trucks and all these kinds of deployment rather than focusing on passenger cars. I think in UK that we are slightly behind on that. The reason behind is because we don't have many refueling stations and we don't have our own models for buses or cars at, as of yet. The system just isn't similar, is it? It, it? So it almost needs to get over that that gap first, and then the then the hydrogen can be factored into it. But the, that, the general architecture, like you say, is is a bit different. We talk about using the potential of hydrogen fuels as we have for these harder to reach areas, transport being a big one. We've already touched on trucks, but what about uh, aviation and shipping? We're hearing a lot of talk about 2030 onwards, major aircraft manufacturers bringing hydrogen as one of their main fuel supplies going forward. Do you see that as a realistic target? Do you think that there's a risk that it might be used on one or two aircraft or one or two routes and not quite the, the scale at which is being imagined? 
Uh, I would I would definitely go for you know my basic approach for bringing this cost down is you have to go bigger and bigger, and mm -hmm. if you take the extreme case, which means you just simply go to the aviation sector, and aviation sector is the one of the biggest sector in terms of the utilization because you know it depends on the flight time and all these kind of things. But you since you are going bigger, your utilization of hydrogen is gonna get much more advantage. And I just briefly on that, uh, I myself you know. Uh, it was to last year. Last year, I set up this uh, International Hydrogen Aviation Forum. And this is the world first forum where I personally realized, you know, you have to really do something to, to get together and then promote the people that you, you, you know, there is something need to be done in the aviation. Mm -hmm. The reason behind is uh, the aviation is the one where you are getting the biggest advantage. And also likewise in, in shipping and marine, because these are the two heavy burden and heavy fueling investment sectors. And there is the, you know, there is the, I would say the main potential because you can e easily bring the cost down. You are talking tons of hydrogen there. And I, I would say both sectors are equally beneficial and we should really, you know, we should really push that forward and it will really help all of us. Because of course, both sectors as well are critical to global trade. They're critical to globalization 4.0. They're critical to economic growth that they're a mainstay in the economy. So it's certainly not going to be a case of having to phase them out necessarily. If you had to describe the sentiment about hydrogen or using hydrogen as a fuel within aviation and shipping five years ago, and then describe it compared to now, what, what one or two words, which would the one or two words be that you would choose to describe that change? Yeah, so the main, main change, what we have noted, uh, if I compare five years ago, to be honest, I have not seen any of the announcements coming, especially from aviation. And now, uh, after five years, one of the major change I've seen is the Airbus is leading mm. quite a quite a, I would say, say big statements coming through. Air has, Airbus has announced, uh, I think they are talking by 2035, their first uh, aircraft would be, you know, hydrogen-based aircraft would be a way passenger, yeah, commercial basically. passenger, passenger, mm -hmm. commercial passenger. So it means it's a very big statement. Whereas now Boeing, you know, they, they have taken a different approach and they don't still believe in that. And they are still, I think, he hesitating in taking that approach. But I would say definitely the reason behind again is now people are realizing there are two key, uh, you know, uh, messages behind that. First thing, everyone realized that in order to bring hydrogen costs down, you have to go big Bigger and aircrafts and these all these major suppliers they are now looking into that area why not we we get otherwise we will be very outdated on that the second the second main message here is coming from the political kind of you know mm. push and majority of the what's called the the uh, the high level politicians they are now realizing the the effect of this zero emission uh, benefits compared to you know what we were doing or looking five years ago and mainly it is coming from let's say the global warming kind of you know uh, issues around us and everyone can see we were talking slightly earlier about this you know harsh winter kind of conditions and this is all extreme cases you, you for global warming i think the people don't understand it's not always is a warming scenario you have to see the extremes either you go too cold or too hot and mm -hmm. that's that's making these kind of extremes and these are uh, politicians and all these big kind of you know ministers level uh, people they are realizing the fact we have to do something and hydrogen is certainly front and center of news headlines at the moment that has been really for the last seven to eight months it has soared to to the top of the agenda looking ahead for 2021 we've got another 10 months or so left what would you say as three bullet points, so short, sharp bullet points that need to be the focus for companies going forward when it comes to hydrogen fuels? Does it need to be yeah. R&D, so talent? Yeah, the very first uh, uh, topic on that I will really try to address and I will ask, I think uh, everyone should look at, is the hydrogen uh, infrastructure in terms of bringing the cost down, which means we are looking specifically the electrolyzers, which are the key elements, you know, uh, how you produce hydrogen. So bringing the electrolyzer cost as quickly as possible down. The only way around that is you have to go bigger and bigger, which is megawatt of installations. It's back to this economies of scale, which of course isn't new. We've seen this with all energy markets and it's even uh, most recently with solar and wind. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the critical thing right. that underpins everything. 
That's right. So this is the first. The second, I think, again, we have to take a regional approach. And to mm -hmm. be honest here, I am pointing towards Middle East, you know, which is really fantastic in my opinion. Uh, when you are looking for bringing the hydrogen down, hydrogen cost down, which is our first point, which we have discussed, you mm -hmm. need for a green hydrogen, either you need a solar or wind. And uh, you have to go to those regions where you have the you know hydrogen hubs easily can be deployed. For example, Middle East is a very good example. Saudi Arabia, they have announced, I believe uh, last year, somewhere in 2020, very big project. I think they are, uh, they are calling this the world largest hydrogen production plant to be- Five billion US dollar project, Neom as well, an air product. Uh, that's very correct, air product, yeah. So you can see now people are trying to realize that Middle, Middle East has to, you know, uh, come up basically and give this bonus and this advantage to bring this cost down because of very cheap renewable, especially the solar solar energy. Australia is a very good example mm -hmm. for us for this. So, so the, there are regional approach and we have to establish some hydrogen production hubs into those regions. And I would say this would be the highest priority, you know, if we, we are looking into that. So that's, that's the second point. The third one we were briefly touching upon anyway, we have to really start looking to upgrade the hydrogen fueling infrastructure mm -hmm. all across you know many 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 regions so within europe there are some clusters so we have given an example like in in, in europe germany is definitely taking a lead france also doing very well uh, the third one i would say switzerland is also doing well but the other regions are very very you know there's hardly anything i can give, give you an example we are uh, developing you know a first of this kind fuel cell bus project in hungary and one of the biggest challenge we are facing in Hungary, there's hardly any refueling station. And our buses would be ready by August this year. And uh, there's hardly any refueling station for us to refuel. And we are trying to, you know, take our business case to the Hungarian government, telling them, you know, you have to do something. So it's, it's a regional push is required. Uh, you can't do one thing. You need to bring both chicken and egg together to keep surviving. And of course, that's usually quite an expensive thing to do to bring them together, which is why people tend to choose one or the other. And at the moment, with the, the economic outlook that the IMF said last year, potentially the worst global state for the, the economy uh, since the Great Depression in the 1930s, of course, we're, we're doing a slog and, and climbing out of it slowly this year. Uh, also have sustained lower oil prices, which will affect a lot of energy stakeholders. And the Hydrogen Council warning that up to 50 billion US dollar shortfall when it comes to getting green hydrogen and cost parity with other types of hydrogen. So the numbers as well here are, are, are a huge factor when it comes to this chicken and egg scenario, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that's very correct. So as, as we were briefly touching upon, and you may have heard the very recent announcement from this Hydrogen Co Council latest report, they are talking 300 billion US mm. dollar to be invested by, I think by 2030 time frame and if you really look what is inside that that package and you uh, i would categorize basically what they are looking again is you know it's a major kind of uh, investment which depends on three key key kind of areas one is they are looking the industrial applications mainly the steel decarbonization the fertilizer sector where you can be use ammonia uh, which is again a green and blue ammonia for example coming from straight from hydrogen you are also using industrial uh, utilization of hydrogen so it's a one one case is a industrial usage of hydrogen you have to really you know push forward as much as mm -hmm. we can the second sector everyone understand is the development of the hydrogen production hubs all around the world basically mm -hmm. and here we are talking different regional approach i gave the example for example i i would say we have to really connect the dots between regions so let's say if we we've pick, got, we've got uh, europe and uh, europe in the middle east as, as one potential import export region of course then exactly so that's exactly. One. The, the, the second example, like, like you have to connect uh, Australia with the other part of the, you know, like so South Korea, Japan, for example, mm -hmm. this is another regional approach there. So you have to really pick the basic concept here is you have to pick the renewable rich countries and then you have to pick the hydrogen demanding countries. Uh, which are really eager to find the you know uh, to, uh, which cannot produce their own hydrogen cheaply because they don't have uh, cheap renewable sources and then simply you produce the hydrogen in a cheap resource region and then you pick the the, the most demanding country and then just simply connect them together and these countries have to talk to each other they do but geopolitics always plays a role and always seems to muddy things i'm sure so thank you so much Naveed, for talking to us it's been very insightful and I think there's certainly a lot for us to think on. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for uh, for your kind introduction and kind interview. It was my great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.